Hello beautiful people, my name is Vendi and I have a confession to make. I am an English major. Now if you've been with me for a little while, I know what you might be thinking. Vendi, my love, my light, my darling. I know that times have been a little bit difficult to keep up with ever since the quarantine, but you have already graduated college. And to that I say, yes, I did. And I graduated with an undergrad degree of writing literature and publishing, which is only one third English major. But times have changed and I am starting my master's in creative writing and literature, which brings my English major cred up, I think. And now that I can claim the role, I think that I am more than qualified to do the English major book tag created by my dear friend Hannah from the channel Snow White Reader, whose channel I will have listed in the description box below along with the tag questions. We got a lot of questions to cover and as we all know, English majors never shut up. So grab a warm beverage of your choice, put on your reading glasses that may or may not be just for the aesthetic and let's strap on in. Question number one is romanticism. Pick a book that you wear rose-colored glasses for or a book that deserves a reread and you get bonus points if you can associate a memory with the book. I mean, let's just get this one out of the way. We all know what's coming. It's the Witchland series by Susan Dennard beginning with Truth Witch. To say that I wear rose-colored glasses for this series is I think a little bit of an understatement but also a bit of an overstatement because I think that it's less rose-colored glasses and absolutely just the series is that good. Not only is the next book in the series and the penultimate book of the saga in its entirety coming out very, very soon, so I need to reread these books to dive back into the world and fully immerse myself into the fandom of this wonderful, beloved series. But it's also just one of those books that's compulsively rereadable. There's a new layer to uncover every single time I pick up Truth Witch, whether it's um, a new character arc that I hadn't figured out before or a new aspect to the world building or the general global plot that wasn't evident to me when I was reading book one, but became evident as I continued with the story and realized how much Susan Dennard had woven in from the very beginning of the series. Series. And aside from the complexity of the world and the various character interrelations, it's also just so damn fun. You have adventure on the high seas, you have basically hot zombies? Question mark? Still unsure about what's going on with those. You have political intrigue galore, you have basically an eco-fantasy because the great big bad evil is climate change? Or like the fantasy version thereof, and it's just, it's so good and so interesting. And every single time you read it, something new comes out of it, and also everything old about it holds up. Now, as far as memories I have associated with the series, um, you can check out my channel and I'll have it linked in the description box below. I got to interview Susan Dennard um, when Blood Witch came out and I got to talk to her about this world and these characters that mean so much to me. And it was one of my favorite parts of my booktube experience thus far. Overall, my experience with these books and their creator and the other fans of this series has been a huge net positive. So yeah, I think it's fair to say I have a little bit of rose-colored glasses when it comes to this series, but I also think it's definitely worth it and very much earned. Prompt number two is my favorite and yours, John Mulaney. He is an English major. And the way that he describes being an English major during one of his stand-up sets is deeply, deeply, deeply accurate. So the prompt associated with John Mulaney is to pick a book that accurately represented an aspect of yourself. Um, and with this one, I'm also doing a bit of a throwback. So we're gonna have something old, but we're also gonna have something new. And the books that I'm going to mention for this are How to Make a Wish by Ashley Herring Blake and You Should See Me in a Crown by Leah Johnson. The thing that both of these books have in common is teenage sapphics figuring out um, one of their first loves. <laughs> the reason I say both of these books is because the way that the sapphic relationships at the heart of both of them are treated are very much like they're central to the story, but they're not like made a big deal of or sensationalized or turned into like the conflict. The love that Grace and Ava have for each other and the love that Mac and Liz develop are so organic and sweet and there's never a question of whether that love is there. Despite all of the other circumstances, despite all of the rest of the pain, the love that they share, that these young women share is ever present and it acts as a beacon. The love that I have for women is one of the greatest joys I've ever experienced. And so for that reason, I'm choosing these two for the John Mulaney prompt. Prompt number three. So you want to teach. So English degrees are super versatile, or at least that's the thing I'm telling myself as I'm working on my master's. However, everyone makes the assumption or the sort of tongue in cheek comment that teaching will be the inevitable thing that you do. So for this prompt, pick a book that went further into depth than you expected, or a book that surprised you with the breadth of topics that it covered. And this is a series that's new to me, but has definitely become one of my all-time favorites. Um, and it is the Live Ship Traders trilogy by Robin Hobb. I'm currently reading The Mad Ship with my friend Katie from A Sea of Tones, link in the description as always. And while you'd expect hefty fantasy tomes like this to pack a big punch, what I did not expect um, alongside the action and the adventure and truly even with the character dynamics that I've grown to expect from Hobb was the degree to which 
these books in particular cover like a vast array of feminist issues. It's a multiple point of view story that follows women predominantly uh, from this one family, several generations of women, as they navigate a world that is becoming slowly and insidiously uh, more misogynistic and is taking more and more power away from them. And it's so fascinating to watch all of these women respond to these changes differently, whether they sort of are like, if you can't beat them, join them, or whether they're defeated, or whether they're working um, slowly against these power structures. And alongside these themes of um, a growing and sort of ever-present um, misogyny, we also have as a sort of parallel but worse uh, concepts of slavery and capitalism and the concept of commoditizing personhood. Robin Hobb, you own my heart. I. There's nothing more I can say at this point. Prompt number four is symbolism. And this one is rather simple. Pick a book that represents something you love. I have a book that represents several somethings that I love, and it is The Language of Thorns by Lee Bardugo. I absolutely love uh, diegetic stories, so story within a story. I absolutely love fairy tales and the rewriting of them to make them make a little bit more sense um, and to grant women especially more agency. And more than anything else in the entire world, I love art. And this is such an artful book. Look at that. From the cover to the foiling to all of the stuff on the inside, this is a stunning book inside and out. I also really love community and the Grishaverse, um, particularly Shadow and Bone. That community is sort of rising up again. Not that it was ever gone, but I anticipate it'll have a huge resurgence, what with the Shadow and Bone TV show coming out very, very soon. So when I look at the language of thorns, I see so many things I love, but more than anything, um, I think that everyone after this full year at this point of Corona kicking our butts. The thing I love most is the sense of togetherness that it represents for me every time I see it. Prompt number five is pretentious complex. What is a book that you read and that you bring up in conversation to impress people? <laughs> so I want to say Infinite Jest for this by David Foster Wallace just because it's an enormous fucking book and it's also deeply dense and hard to get through, but I'm still making my way through that one so I can't quite say it. Ditto for A Little Life, ditto for La Miz. But something that I absolutely can say that I've gotten through and that I didn't feel like I'd gotten through it, but that I thoroughly enjoyed doing it and actually plan on doing so again, and I'm going to be showing off my fantasy chops here, um, it's The Silmarillion by J.R.R. Tolkien. <laughs> if you are even a little bit familiar with the Tolkien verse, then you may know that The Silmarillion is essentially um, what Tolkien considered his magnum opus. It is the encyclopedia, basically, for the world of The Lord of the Rings. It is a history of the land of Arda literally before its creation, like from God onward, basically. It's part creation myth. It's part history. It's part a little bit, at the very least, like... Uh, like a translator's guide for the myriad languages that Tolkien created. And as a huge Tolkien geek, I found it absolutely fascinating. I was the nerd who, after reading uh, The Return of the King, spent hours upon hours dissecting all of the little bits of information um, inside of the appendices listed at the end of the books. And the Silmarillion is like that, but dialed to a million. <laughs> You'll meet a lot of folks that really enjoy the Lord of the Rings movies. You'll even see occasionally some folks who enjoy the Hobbit movies or who've read the Hobbit and even some brave souls who've read the Lord of the Rings. But I feel like it's a little rarer to meet somebody who's read the Silmarillion. So if I bragged about the books I read, and I guess I'm doing that right now, that's the book that I would have to brag about. Prompt number six is Iambic Pentameter. What is a book that took you a while to get into, but once you got the concept, you absolutely fell in love? And for me, this is less a book and more of a genre. I'll be holding up Get Alive, Chloe Brown by Talia Hibbert uh, as an example, but the genre is romance, particularly of the new adult age range. I'm not gonna lie, it definitely took me, as a predominantly sci-fi fantasy reader, a little bit of time to okay myself with sort of lowering the stakes of things and accepting that in a story sometimes the stakes are normal. Sometimes the stakes are just regular human things. It doesn't always have to be a war. It doesn't always have to be an insurrection. Sometimes what you're worried about is whether two people are going to fall in love and whether their love is going to last. And that's pretty damn good, especially over the quarantine where I was worried that real life would turn into a proper dystopia because it kind of felt like it had. Letting myself lower those stakes in the books that I was reading was like a blessing. And I realized letting myself was the main hurdle to overcome. I had like a sort of block where I convinced myself that I needed those high stakes um, in order to enjoy a thing. And I absolutely don't. As long as the character's there, I'm in. And what I will tell you about romance writers, they fucking know character. Because character is truly at the heart of everything about their stories. Prompt number seven is the art of BSing. The way that Hannah described BSing or bullshitting is the art of 
arguing for the possibility for something to be true. And I can't help but agree, like that's absolutely what it is. It's taking a conclusion and then finding elements that support the conclusion and using those to build your argument rather than the other way around. But the prompt is, what is a book that you could debate about for eternity? And again, it's not quite a book, though I will be holding up um, a book later to describe an aspect of it. For me, it's the concept of young adult literature. And I realize that that might be a cop out just because as a concept, there's so many things to talk about it with uh, from the sort of denigration of the age range within literary spheres by many, many people, despite it pretty regularly having the leeway to push boundaries of form. For example, Sally Green's Half Bad using a lot of uh, second person, which was not the standard for a very long time, but was super successful for that series or pushing boundaries of diversity and inclusion, for example, uh, Felix Ever After by Case and Callender, which isn't to say that adult books aren't, for example, trans inclusive or don't push boundaries of form. I'm just saying that for the commercial things, they don't tend to do that much. Whereas in YA, the commerciality often pushes behind those things that are new and exciting and interesting. That being said, you could also argue that YA is deeply insular um, and that it has a very long way to go to making itself actually more inclusive for the people who it needs to be more inclusive for, not just on a content perspective, but on a creator perspective. Where are our people of color editors? You know? Where are our women of color agents? And let's not even dip our toe into the fact that it seems to be aging as a category. The characters that YA is representing seem to be aging up with the readership that is reading it. So instead of 14, 15, 16 year olds, you're oftentimes getting 19 or even 20 year olds um, in the genre that's supposed to be for teens. Though there has been of late some pushing that back with writers such as Elle McKinney and her Nightmare Verse books, where the books are very clearly aimed towards the audience that they're marketed for, and they are no less brilliantly done for it. But I have more questions to cover, so let me not. Let me not go into my YA rant. <laughs> Prop number eight is Old Dead White Guy, a very represented bunch in the English literature spheres, both in the terms of who we're reading and who is teaching things. Pick a book that has not aged well, but that you either love or hate. And again, I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about this, but Peter Pan by J.M. Barry. There's some problematic content, y'all. A little bit of racism. When I say a little bit, a little more than just a little bit. And yeah, Wendy Darling was not treated in a way that we would consider um, chill as modern day readers. However, I adored this book. It's my favorite book of all time for so many reasons, not the least of which being the whimsicality and the wonder and the magic of it. The themes of stagnation versus moving forward. Ideas about what masculinity mean and don't mean and what they could mean if they were taken through the childish lens that is Peter's. There's so much about this story that I love and that I will never stop loving, even though mm, it's got some parts to it that need a little bit of revising, I think. <laughs> Home stretch now, prompt number nine is Dark Academia. Pick a character that you love, but you know in your heart you would not get along. Mm, and it hurts me to say it, but Darlington from Ninth House by Lee Bardugo. Listen, listen, I'm a little bit over rich white boys. <laughs> Let me explain. I think Darlington is a lovely character. He is definitely the soft cinnamon roll to Alex Stern's sort of more badass and, um, agency having self. He's deeply intelligent and super fun to read about and the consequence that happened to him at the end of this book, just whoa. Lots of bad happens to him. Deeply compelling character to read. I don't think we'd get along. <laughs> For my undergrad, I went to a liberal arts college. I have met so many lit bros and film bros. And let me tell you something about lit bros and film bros. <sighs> you know, let me not. Um, suffice it to say, let me summarize. They have an inflated sense of ego they really love to be right. And even the ones that seem nicest have oof, just a healthy dose of privilege that they do not seem to be able to look past. And I think a little bit Darlington has all of that. He's going to an Ivy League school, man. Let me not, let me not. I don't think we get along on a very surface level. Perhaps if we could move past our initial arguments, we could eventually find points of closeness and an ability to get along. But at the very least, at the very start, we would butt heads like crazy. I would not let him get away with any of his shit. And I think he would call me on a lot of my shit that I don't like to own up to all the time. And I think it would just be a very volatile in real life meeting. And then finally, bonus question, what are your favorite and least favorite books that you had to read because of school? I'm gonna start with my least favorite so that I can end with my favorites to leave the video on a positive note. For this, I have like a three-way tie. House of the Seven Gables, 
The Scarlet Letter, both by Nathaniel Hawthorne, I believe, which maybe I just don't get along with his writing style. But the one that I think upsets me most because I was primed to like it, I thought I'd really enjoy it, is The Wind Up Bird Chronicle by Murakami. The small minutia of things and the little thought spirals you do, like I get it as a stylistic choice, it's just not for me. But then you start talking about women and none of it's good. None of it's good. Just say you hate women. Just do it. Just do it. I dare you. As far as favorites, I am such an easy reader to please. I like so many things. A quick list. Catcher in the Rye. Don't come at me. Cat's Cradle. Again, don't come at me. Oryx and Crake by Margaret Atwood. The Intuitionist by Colson Whitehead. Beautiful. Waiting by Hodgin. I have read a myriad of lovely things that I don't think I would have picked up uh, were they not assigned to me. And I kick myself daily um, for the sort of strict parameters I've put around myself um, and my reading by, you know, calling myself like a sci-fi fantasy reader, etc. So I think one of the things I love best about studying this topic is how much my shores have been expanded, if you will. There is such a breadth of human experience um, and, and empathy that I think that you get by reading broadly, by understanding the things, um, the, the things that frightened or fascinated people from other times, from other cultures. And I think one of the best ways to access those things is through the art that those people create, especially if you can do it um, as a meeting of minds with other people who have different experiences from you. And I think, yeah, that's my favorite part, I think, uh, about literature courses. And before I ramble any longer, I'm going to call it here. That's it. That is my English major book tag. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you liked it, please leave it a thumbs up. And if you like me, maybe consider subscribing to my channel. I post videos every weekend, more or less, and I would love to have you join my little booktube family. If you're interested in seeing more bookish content from me, all of my socials are linked in the description box below. Thank you again so much for watching this video, and I will see you with the next one very, very soon. Goodbye.